Welcome to NucleCast, the official podcast of the Anwa Deterrence Center. Each week, we bring you leading experts for a lively discussion on topics related to strategic nuclear deterrence. Our host is Dr. Adam Lowther, Director of Strategic Programs at the National Strategic Research Institute. The views of the hosts and the guests are their own. Welcome back to another exciting episode of NucleCast. Of course, I am Adam Lowther, the voice that you hear every time we have this show, with one exception, with one exception, and we had a guest then. Now, today we do have a great guest, and I say that without reservation. Of course, Eric Edelman, you know him. He's an institution. He's a legacy. Uh, he is somebody that has been around D.C. 30 years in government, He's, geez, the career is, I'm not going to lie, Eric, as I sit here and think about your introduction, I'm kind of jealous because you've had a wonderful career that many aspire to, uh, many of the young and ambitious in D.C., and you've done it. So today, of course, Eric is at CSBA, is one of the dawns of that storied institution. It's one of the great thinking institutions of D.C. these days. And he is writing and thinking and offering advice. And, uh, of course, I often read it. So with that, Eric, thanks for joining us on NucleCast. Well, Adam, thanks for having me. It's really a pleasure to be with you today. Yeah, this is this is actually pretty exciting. Whenever I saw that you were going to be on the show, I was like, this is awesome. Because I like to, it's always great to have the opportunity to capture the thoughts and ideas of folks who have been around a long time, have institutional memory, have watched the, you know, the ebbs and flows of the, the nuclear world and have a perspective of that time that, you know, for, for me, you know, I, I became, I wrote a dissertation on Americans and asymmetric warfare after 9-11. And so I only got into the nuclear world by happenstance, because I had gone to the Air Force Research Institute, there was an accident, and they were like, well, you're going to handle it. And so it was purely by happenstance, whereas you've had a, a career that has spanned, you know, all of these dramatic changes. And as part of the capturing of that experience, you've written a new chapter in the book, The New Makers of Modern Strategy, which I, I'll be honest with you, I have a copy. I bought one of the first copies out. Uh, I haven't read through the, the the volume yet, but I look forward to that chance. So let, let's delve into your chapter. What did you say? Why did you say it? And how is it relevant to today? Well, um, uh, Adam, I was really... Uh, you know, thrilled and privileged that my uh, colleague at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, Hal Brandt, who is the editor of this volume that follows in the footsteps of two great earlier volumes, uh, one, the, the original Makers of Modern Strategy that was written in the World War II era, before the advent of nuclear weapons, by the way, um, and then a successor volume that came out in the mid-80s at the height of the Cold War that was edited by uh, Peter Perret and John Shai and um, had a, a fantastic chapter on uh, nuclear strategy by uh, Lawrence Friedman, you know, our, our college our colleague at King's College London, who uh, literally has written the book on the evolution of nuclear strategy. So it was a little daunting when Hal said, uh, you know, we need a, a chapter on nuclear strategy. Um, and my colleague at Johns Hopkins, uh, uh, Frank Gavin, uh, who has written a lot on uh, the uh, nuclear history of the Cold War, uh, had written a companion chapter in the book, uh, which makes an argument that is, you know, um, it's very interesting, like everything Frank writes, sort of brilliant and, and fascinating. But he made a, a part of his argument was that uh, there's really no through line that connects uh, the force structure and force posture uh, that the United States of America has adopted over the years in the nuclear area with the writings of, you know, the classic authors on uh, 
uh, nuclear strategy, who wrote it, Brand and elsewhere, uh, Princeton, other places in the early years of the Cold War and throughout the Cold War. Um, and so uh, Hal said, we really have to have a chapter that actually talks about, you know, the, the, the strategists and what they wrote about. So would you be willing to uh, write about it? And I was happy to do it. I mean, one of the things that struck me um, while I sat in my last job in government as Undersecretary of Defense for Policy uh, in the last uh, second term of the uh, George W. Bush administration, uh, I sat on the Nuclear Weapons Council. And one of the things that really struck me was how much um, our nuclear deterrence skills had deteriorated over the years. And, uh, you know, while I was in office, we had, uh, you know, the incident at Minot uh, Air Force Base where uh, live armed nuclear weapons were sent down to Barksdale where they didn't have the uh, no longer had the um, capability of receiving uh, those weapons, which sparked a, uh, you know, a, a kind of a huge brouhaha publicly, uh, led Secretary um, um, uh, Rumsfeld to empower a, a panel uh, to uh, headed by former uh, Secretary of Defense, the late Jim Schlesinger, to review that. One of the things that that panel concluded was that our nuclear uh, deterrent skills were deteriorating, including in uh, the laboratories where human capital had really become quite depleted. I know that's a subject you know something about from you know firsthand. Uh, you know we we had not built a new nuclear weapon you know since uh, 1988, and we hadn't tested one since 1991. Um, and so the the kind of if you will the um, you know the hard uh, you know, hardware skills uh, had deteriorated, but the Schlesinger panel pointed out that our software skills, that is having a lot of people in OSD who knew something about nuclear deterrence uh, had deteriorated as well. And uh, about a year or so later, the Defense Science Board had a similar study in which they said the nation's nuclear deterrent skills had deteriorated. And um a lot of that had to do with the end of the Cold War, you know, the assumption that, you know, well, now that we no longer had this central strategic antagonism with a nuclear armed ideologically, you know, opposed opponent, uh, we were, you know, not ever going to have to use these things really, you know, they, they, you know, really could just gather dust and, um, and not really require any deep thinking about them. And so one of the things I did when I left government was start to teach a course at, at, uh, SICE at on um, nuclear strategy. And uh, really it was about when I started doing this, which is almost 10 years ago now, um, it was, it'd been about 20 years since the subject had been, you know, taught at, um, at, um, at SICE. And so, you know, what I tried to bring to this essay was um, the sensibility of someone who not only has, you know, sort of read Wolstetter and, uh, Brody and uh, Herman Kahn and, and Tom Schelling, uh, Bob Jervis and others, but someone who's also had responsibility for uh, both uh, certifying the nuclear stockpile every year and the nuclear stockpile stewardship memo to the president, you know, basically telling them, telling the president of the United States, yes, sir, you know, or ma'am, you know, if, uh, if you need to use these things, we certify that they will go bang. You know, but uh, also they're not going to go bang when you don't want them to. So, um, you know, I tried to bring that uh, to to bear and to sort of resuscitate what I like to call the kind of lost language of of nuclear strategy that, you know, people are you know, now becoming more familiar with again. You know, the, the idea of, uh, you know, what nuclear deterrence ask actually means, the ability of uh, assured, you know, uh, second strike capability, um, the difference between deterrence by punishment and deterrence by denial, you know, going through all of the evolution of ideas, which even if they didn't directly contribute to, you know, a force structure or strategy, because for the first 10 years, really, the main strategy was by what uh, some scholars have called applied strategists. That was President Eisenhower and Secretary Dulles and uh, a few other uh, policymakers. It's only really when you get into the Kennedy years when uh, Robert McNamara brings in Bill Kaufman from Rand and others that you begin to get some impact of these ideas. And, and one of the things I, 
try to talk about in the essay, uh, you know, are uh, two sort of really big questions. One is, is deterrence easy or is deterrence hard? Because there's a, you know, a school of thought starts with Brody really in 1945, right after the, um, you know, the uh, detonation of the nuclear weapons at Hiroshima and Nagasaki that basically says, look, up until now, uh, defense uh, establishments have uh, had as their business preparation for war. From now on, their preparation has to be to prevent war. And so there's this effort, you know, F- emphasis on deterrence and this sense that the fact of nuclear weapons, and particularly once the Soviets test in 1949 and their two nuclear powers, that it's kind of easy because both sides have nuclear weapons and neither one really wants to use them. This is an idea sort of it's sometimes called existential deterrence. Uh, Kenneth, the late Kenneth Waltz, um, uh, among others, had you know touted this idea that you really don't need that many. Sometimes it takes its form in um, in the idea of minimal deterrence, that you don't really need that many weapons because just a few of them is enough to deter the other side. And then there's really another school of thought, which I find more compelling, uh, which was you know, articulated by people like Albert Rolstetter and, and others, that no, actually, this is kind of a complicated business because it's not just enough to, you know, to have some weapons in, on your side. You have to be able to have enough to withstand actually a disabling first strike and then still impose enough uh, destruction and cost on your opponent that they will actually think twice about initiating you know, a nuclear exchange. So I spent some time in the essay talking about is deterrence, you know, easy, is it hard? And then the the other thing that I um, uh, focus on a little bit is the evolution of the um, uh, change from what was originally kind of what we now call, um, what we we now call counter force targeting as opposed to counter value targeting. Originally, we targeted essentially big urban industrial areas and cities. Uh, But over time, policymakers gravitated towards targeting the adversaries, command and control, their nuclear forces, uh, the things that uh, would allow leadership to actually execute nuclear war if, God forbid, what happened. And over time, the writings of academic theorists of nuclear strategy really diverged a lot from the practice, which is why my essay is entitled Nuclear Strategy in Theory and Practice. And I, I wanted to try and explain a little bit about why I think that happened. And it really happened, in my view, for two two reasons. One is that sort of nuclear uh, theory and strategy sort of went in the direction of mutual assured destruction is a condition. It's not a strategy or a theory. There's no way to get out of it. And the only real way out is arms control. And Policymakers, I think, uh, both because they had, you know, what um, uh, what Max Weber would have called an ethic of responsibility, uh, basically uh, believed that they owed it to the American people to not stop their thinking at the point at which deterrence fails, but to uh, think about how to minimize the damage to the United States of America and the American people if, God forbid, we did have a nuclear exchange, and therefore they gravitated towards what's what are called damage limitation strategies or counter force strategies. Uh, defenses are a part of that, of course. Um, and the second reason is that, uh, as Sir Michael Quinlan has pointed out, a, a British colleague who uh, devoted his entire professional life really to the British independent nuclear deterrent, to really have an effective deterrent, you have to have one that the adversary believes you might use credibly and therefore that you have a force that uh, you might actually use and not just to destroy their population, but to hold at risk the things that they actually value. And unless you do that, you don't really have a deterrent. So that's really kind of what the essay talks about. And I apologize for the length of the response. (laughs) No, you're, uh, you're good. You know, you talk about easy and hard deterrence, and this is something Keith Payne's been writing about lately. Is he's been quite prolific, and and then one of the things he and I were talking a while back, and I've become I was doing a debate in uh, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists with some physicists who had been critical of a book I had done a couple two or three years ago, and. <clears throat> 
I came to the sort of the conclusion that there's no real way to, con- there are some people for whom this is almost, it's like a cult-like belief in that there's, you know, there's, we must disarm, you know, in some respects, going back to your discussion about easy and hard and, you know, damage limitation, you know, this portrayal of Herman Kahn as, you know, a sort of a crazy guy and that you can't really think about these rationally and you sort of hand wave and you just say, you know, all war, all, you know, in the, the use of a, you know, 100 ton nuclear weapon that, you know, it's, it's all strategic. It's all, you know, it all leads to nu- you know, to Armageddon and, and just these hand waves to the point that I think, and this goes back to your original point you made that it, it makes deterrence not credible. And so my argument to people is we have to think about how to fight and win a nuclear war because that's how you maintain credibility. You plan for it, you build for it, you train for it. And then in the process, the, the, you know, the result is effective deterrence. Do, how do you see sort of the dynamic in this broader issue? No, look, you've put your finger on one of the uh, you know, biggest problems I think we have in the public debate about, about these issues. So those folks, particularly the ones in government who I've been talking about who have you know, spent their careers working on counterforce strategies, are frequently criticized as, you know, as having a nuclear war fighting strategy and that that is bad because it essentially lowers the threshold uh, for nuclear use and might tempt policymakers into actually using nuclear weapons uh, when they obviously should never, ever do it. But the, the problem is that, you know, nuclear deterrence is a bit of a, a paradox because the, the, you know, I don't think any of us want to fight a nuclear war. I mean, in any nuclear war, you know, no matter how limited, would be catastrophic on multiple levels. But the paradox is that, as you say, the only way to effectively deter is if the you know adversary uh, believes you have a force that can uh, wreak unacceptable damage on them. And you know, the trick is how do you how do you develop a force that can a, do that and then convey to them that you have a force that can do it. And that's very hard. It's not not at all easy. I mean, th- this is something Henry Kissinger uh, noted, and I, I quote from him as an epigram to the chapter in, in his book, The Necessity of Choice in 1961, which was written, by the way, just you know on the cusp of uh, ICBMs coming and SLBMs coming you know into the force and therefore reducing the warning time that national leaders had to make decisions about uh, nuclear war from, you know, a luxurious five or six hours to, you know, 30, uh, 30 minutes. And Kissinger was very worried about that. And one of the things he said is the problem with nuclear deterrence is that it depends on something totally intangible, which is the perception of the adversary, which you can never know for sure. You know, the best you can do is, you know, study it and try and approximate it. And, and try to understand it and then try to hold at risk the things that they value the most. But it's, it's an uncertain science to, to say the, the least. Um, but, you know, everybody who's tried to make the deterrent more credible and more effective then gets accused of actually, uh, you know, promoting um, a, uh, a strategy that might lead to nuclear war rather than deter it. So it's a little bit of a kind of rhetorical trick box that you find yourself in when you get into these kinds of debates. This episode of NucleCast is brought to you by the AMLA Deterrent Center, whose mission is to educate Americans about the nuclear enterprise and strategic deterrence. So I want to change topics and I want to ask you about testimony where you and Frank Miller testified on Capitol Hill not too terribly long ago. 
tell us about that testimony and what is this bigger issue and challenge that we're having with, you know, we're going to have two peers pretty soon. I, I mean, I would argue that people want to say near peers. I would submit that the Russians are a peer, if not better, and that the Chinese are, uh, I've long been, you know, like you, I, I get briefs from different agencies in the government and I hear the numbers and I've long suspected just from my time working China and working in China that our expectation is a bit low. My colleagues at uh, NSRI have written a really good article in the Usanka Journal about how much additional weapons grade plutonium the Chinese probably have than we've originally estimated. And so I, you know, this idea that China is going to be a peer or potentially, and they're building a breeder. They're they're building a breeder reactor, which the Russians are you know supplying. So uh, yeah. potentially they're going to. So y'all testify. So Jeffrey about Lewis, this. who's argued, so Jeffrey Lewis, who's <laughs> been arguing for years that the Chinese will be limited because of their lack of access to fissile material. I mean, his basic you know contention is just being, I think, destroyed by the reality of their ability to produce more fissile material. Yeah, and and Chris Yaw and. John Swiegel looked back when they had these reactors in the past before they were shut. They think that much more plutonium came out of those reactors than, than we originally estimated. So I, you know, the Chinese are clearly building, they're doubling quickly and they're building the holes for the, you know, for ICBMs. They're, you know, they're building new bombers. They're doing everything. So we're going to have two peers or two superior powers you and Frank testified about this. What is y'all's take and what is your take specifically on this challenge? Well, it's a completely novel challenge that we never have faced, you know, historically before. I mean, Frank and I were asked to, ta to testify last September by the Senate Armed Services Committee. Uh, and we testified along with um, the majority witnesses, who Madeline Creeden, the former director of NNSA, and, and Rose Gottemuller, who uh, was the negotiator of the New START uh, Treaty in the Obama administration. Um, actually, what was sort of interesting about the hearing was uh, the fact that, you know, despite the political differences, um, I think there was, you know, sort of pretty broad agreement among the witnesses, and, and actually quite strikingly uh, among the members of the Armed Services Committee, that this development is very, very concerning. Um, I mean, in addition to all of the things you mentioned that the Chinese have developed, uh, they tested uh, now about two years ago uh, a uh, what we used to call a fractional orbitable bombardment system. Yes. They essentially yes. put a uh, a warhead, uh, you know, on a hypersonic, a hypersonic glide vehicle that they put into orbit, but uh, not in a circumpolar um, orbit, but, you know, coming from the south. Um, this is something, by the way, that the Soviets uh, experimented with in the 70s and, and, then, um, and then abandoned. Um, although Putin has now said in one of his press conferences talking about exotic new weapons that the Russians have this again. Um, and the problem that presents essentially is since, uh, you know, all of our uh, sensors and uh, early warning and detection is you know, directed in the other direction that, you know, that kind of attack uh, could uh, be a very low or no warning attack. And it would lend itself, of course, potentially to a decapitating first strike that would try and take out, you know, the national command authority and then disable the ability of the United States to respond. Uh, you know, look, there are a lot of questions about would the Chinese ever really do that? You know, that would be a pretty, you know, a sporty roll of the dice you know, by them. But it it bespeaks a sort of mindset that is very, very troubling. And the, you know, uh, the members of the Armed Services Committee, at least, I think, were uh, appropriately seized with this. And the one commonality among all the four witnesses was that, the novelty of all this and the challenges that it presents puts an extraordinary emphasis on the importance of moving forward uh, without any kind of delay uh, 
with our own nuclear modernization efforts. That is the Ohio Place for class, uh, Ohio class replacement uh, uh, for uh, the Columbia class for our SS uh, uh, BNs and and SLBMs uh, and um, the ground launch strategic deterrent to replace the Minuteman three. So the, the land based force uh, or land based leg of the triad also. Uh, is modernized uh, along with the B-21 bomber, which was just rolled out, of course, last fall for the first time. So uh, that was, I think, kind of the the good news. I think where there's still a lot of uncertainty and where we're going to have a lot of work to do uh, collectively, you know, um, and that includes you and me uh, personally <laughs> uh, in our in the work we do, is trying to answer the question that you know Secretary McNamara posed uh, back in the 60s, which is how much is enough? How much do we need to actually deter to near peers? And Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor for the Biden administration, gave a speech uh, a week or so ago, almost two weeks ago now, uh, to the Arms Control Association, in which he acknowledged what you and I have just been talking about, which is the novelty of this circumstance historically for the United States and the challenges that it presents. Um, and he correctly, I think, said that doesn't mean we need to necessarily match the combined arsenals of the Russian and Chinese uh, states warhead for warhead. But what he left unsaid was, uh, and he said, I'm sorry, just to finish what he said, he, he said that, you know, we're developing our own hypersonic conventional uh, weapons and, uh, you know, other w- weapons to to deter that are not nuclear, but there is a nuclear dimension to this that he left really unaddressed, which is we may not need uh, to match them warhead for warhead, but um, with two uh, adversaries with arsenals in the vicinity of like 1,500 warheads each, the 1,550 that we're allowed under the new START treaty I think is probably going to be inadequate. And we have a lot of work to do to figure out how do we structure a force that is able to uh, withstand a first strike from one of the two adversaries and still have enough to both inflict, uh, you know, retaliate, you know, a second strike retaliatory capability that allows us to inflict unacceptable damage on the aggressor while holding the other, um, uh, at bay with a residual force that's sufficient to deter them as well. And that's, in my view, probably got to be higher than 1550, exactly where it, you know, where it is. I think we, we have some work to do to try and figure that out. Yeah, one of the, the big issues, so, you know, I spent the last, I spent three years with the Army and after leaving the Air Force, and part of what that made me do was think a lot more about low-yield and battlefield nuclear weapons and which was, was good because it sort of rounded out my thinking on the topic. And what I've really come to be concerned about is less about, you know, an exchange of ICBMs over the poles and more about low yield. So under one KT up to, you know, a max of maybe 10 KT and those being used by both the Russians and, and the Chinese in, in a theater in which they want us to vacate the theater. So therefore they don't escalate. They use those low yield weapons. They hit discrete targets. Like I've written a couple of articles where I talk about how do you have fallout free? You can do damage. You can set an example, but they're fallout free. So, you know, it's harder to respond in kind. And, and then just the challenge of what we do, don't have to both deter or respond. And and you mentioned, and this is sort of the Biden administration and, and many other folks have said, well, you know, we have all these great, you know, precision guided munitions and conventional prompt global strike, you know, all this kind of stuff. And I, I don't think they understand that. And that both the Chinese and Russians have made clear that's what they fear most. So the solution to the advantage in theater and low yield that they have is to build more weapons that, that they fear are more usable and that we'll actually use to target. Cause this is what authoritarians fear them being targeted. 
And so they, you know, they're really fearful of a, you know, a hyper conventional hypersonic coming in, hitting the Kremlin and killing, you know, Putin specifically. So I, I guess I'm curious as to your take on this, this problem of we're going to solve our mismatch with more PGMs, which we're being told by the Russians they fear. Right. I mean, that's the paradox, right? I mean, you know, sort of uh, the, you know, kind of arms control industrial complex that exists in, you know, Washington, D.C., you know, wants to tell you that, uh, you know, we shouldn't respond to you know, the development of the kind of capabilities you're talking about with nuclear weapons, but with conventional. But it's precisely our preci- precision conventional weapons that are driving them uh, to to seek a way of uh, responding with, with, as you uh, point out, low yield um, nuclear weapons. Uh, look, my colleagues, um, some crass commercial advertising, my colleagues at CSBA, uh, Toshi Yoshihara and Evan Montgomery actually have just published a monograph on uh, the Chinese uh, potential use of uh, of these systems in uh, the region, as opposed, as you say, in the global uh, nuclear balance. Uh, and they are quite concerned about it, that the uh, Chinese might think they have the kinds of coercive nuclear strategies that the Russians have written and talked a lot about over the last 20 years. I mean, I think it's one reason why the nuclear posture review in 2018 was correct to be looking to develop some kinds of capabilities that allow us to, uh, you know, respond in some kind of measured graduated way. That is, as you know, the low yield uh, warhead on the uh, Trident that has already been deployed. And then um, the idea of uh, resuscitating a nuclear uh, armed uh, cruise missile, submarine launched cruise missile, uh, the Slick of Man, although the uh, Biden administration has canceled that. Now, I, th- I think there's going to be a fight with Congress over that. I think Congress will try and restore that. And Frank and I, for instance, testified in the Armed Services Committee that we think Congress should restore that, that that is an important tool that we need to have uh, in order to respond. You hear some arguments that um, that role can be played by the LRSO, uh, the long range uh, cruise missile that the uh, Air Force is developing to go with the B-21. But um, I, I don't want to take up too much time on this, you know, going down this rabbit hole, but I don't think LRSO is enough. And there are some issues about getting it on station as opposed, and, you know, having the flexibility to be able to respond in, you know, uh, in a timely way. So I, um, you know, think that is one step we need to take to address this very real problem that you've identified. Yeah, I'll be honest with you. As I think about it, I'm I'm not a particularly huge fan of the seventy six mod two. I mean, it's it was something, you know. It was it right. was a sort of a solution at a, a stop, stop gap. Yeah, but I've come to increasingly. I, I spent some time at the Reagan Library looking back at all of the lead up to INF and the discussions and debates in in the White House over that. And I, I kind of think they were brilliant at the time to the way they handled it. And I wonder if we should pursue a similar path where we, we you know, we announced the, you know, the fielding of Glickum 2, which would be an LRSO based sort of weapon. And then we, we have Pershing 3. I mean, Pershing scared the hell out of the Russians. It just did. It, it had some capabilities that, that, they just couldn't overcome. And I wonder if perhaps putting that in, in Asia and then back in Europe would, would drive the Russians and the Chinese to rethink their approach, uh, their sort of revanchist approach. Yeah. So again, my colleagues at CSBA and I, several of us were involved in a project that uh, we published last fall called rings of fire, which, uh, talks about um, you know the what the U.S. missile portfolio should look like now that uh, we're out of the INF treaty. Now we were talking pretty explicitly about uh, you know conventional, uh, but of course you know these weapons are potentially inherently dual capable. So uh, you know there's a potential nuclear version as well. I personally think that you know we've already given AUKUS the you know uh, Australia, U.S., U.K. Uh, uh, sort of grouping that we've created to help the Australians with nuclear propulsion for their submarines. Uh, They've already given uh, 
AUKUS the task of developing hypersonic missiles as well. I'd like to actually, um, you know, give them, you know, the kind of, uh, uh, you know, ground launched uh, medium range, you know, um, uh, ballistic missile task as well, because both Australia and the UK would be very logical places to um, deploy those kinds of capabilities if you had them. Yeah. Uh, in terms of range and and being able to hold at risk uh, some of the things that you'd want to hold in uh, at risk in uh, target set in China and or in in Russia, so um, yeah, I mean I think that's something we really need to be thinking about. Now we're we're at the end of the show, and I usually or I've more frequently pulled out. I don't know if you knew, but I do have a crystal ball, and I also have a, a lamp with a genie, and so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give you the opportunity to use my crystal ball and my genie. And I want you to make three wishes about the future to create the future that, that you would want. And so, so you know, the, the genie's here among us. What are your three wishes? Um, well, I, I, I would like the United States Congress to, um, uh, become more responsible about uh, appropriating sufficient uh, funds over a long period of time for the Department of Defense so that it can plan and uh, procure uh, the weapons we need to deter Russia and China uh, and deal with the other you know, challenges we face like North Korea, Iran, and violent extremism, et cetera, uh, w- without the kind of, you know, stop start, uh, you know, uh, experience we've had over the last decade or so since the Budget Control Act came into effect. I mean, the department has been operating under continuing resolutions uh, most of the time. And and so there are, uh, you know, uh, you can't do new starts with, with money under continuing resolution. And it's very hard to program, you know, for capabilities that take some years to, you know, reach initial operating capability uh, in that kind of budgetary environment. So I, you know, that would be number one. Uh, number two would be, uh, to move ahead with the nuclear modernization, uh, you know, uh, as rapidly as, as possible. I mean, I think, uh, my understanding is Northrop is, uh, doing a pretty good job of meeting the various milestones for the ground-based strategic deterrent. But, you know, I, w- I would like to see the Ohio class replacement and, uh, all these other capabilities, uh, move forward. Um, and, and I'd like to see, I guess my third one would be, I'd like to see the, either the Congress or the administration relent on, um, on the, um, you know, the, um, uh, you know, the slick, the submarine launched uh, cruise missile so we can deal with this other problem. I and mean, those three things right away would, I think, you know, be, um, enormous, they would send enormous signals to our adversaries, all three of those things. Yeah, because in the end, this is what I don't, I'm not sure that our friends in the disarmament community realize that for those of us that would like a stronger nuclear deterrent, our objective, we're we're actually peace hawks. We're very hawkish about yes. peace and, and we just want to maintain it in the most, you know, uh, feasible way possible taking into account what our adversaries fear. It's pretty straightforward. Exactly. Exactly. Couldn't have said it better. (laughs) Well, Eric, thanks for uh, coming on. We've been talking to Eric Edelman, who is a Don of the nuclear community. He's one of our great gray beards. I love the, all these terms that we've invented to describe folks who know what they're talking about. So thanks for coming on the show. Well, I fit the bill. I fit the bill when I let it grow out. I have a very gray beard. (laughs) Well, thanks to you and thanks to all the listeners. We appreciate you listening to this episode and we will see you next time. Well, it's easy to have afterthoughts when you've just had a discussion with Eric Edelman. You know, he's one of those guys who's had a, an extensive career in government and now he's at CSBA and he's got a couple of really good reports and then his you know, the chapter in the new makers of modern strategy. And then I, you know, I actually had seen his testimony uh, 
on tripolarity. And so it was a great discussion. I mean, Eric, you know, he's, he's one of the dons of our, of our discipline. So I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, I bet you enjoyed it too. If you think about it for a second, I'm sure you enjoyed it and you were probably nodding your head and thinking, yep, that's right. That's right. So uh, I don't know what to say. It was a great show. This has been a production of the Anwa Deterrence Center. Our executive producer is Kimberly Charrington, and this episode has been engineered and mixed by David Frontal. Follow the show on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter at Nuclecast. Listen, follow, and review the show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts.